Good evening, friends. You're listening to the True Crime Witch Podcast, the podcast that takes you into everything murderous, mysterious, and downright macabre. I'm your host, Emma, and this is a very special episode of the True Crime Witch Podcast. Allow me to explain. So this episode was originally going to be a Patreon-exclusive episode, but in light of the COVID-19 situation... I'm going to be releasing this publicly. Now, worry not, Patreon fans, you'll be getting this first, maybe for a week or an undisclosed amount of time, I haven't decided yet, and then it will go public. But I just thought I wanted to get this out and share it for everyone, so everyone had a chance to listen to it. So, without further ado, this is The Mysterious Death of Ricky McCormick. Ricky C. McCormick was born on June 14th, 1958, in Missouri. During the course of his early years, Ricky dropped out of school and moved around the Missouri, Illinois area, mostly living with his mum and getting involved in petty crimes. He was also known for concocting tall tales and displaying unusual behaviour. McCormick dropped out of school without being able to fully read or write. According to his family, the most that Ricky was able to spell was his own name and often needed help filling out job applications, etc. His own mother even stated that Ricky was, quote, retarded, end quote. Now, I don't usually like to use that word, but that was a direct quote from a family member, so it seems that he had possibly had intellectual disabilities. His aunt even told investigators and media that Quote, Ricky went to see a psychiatrist and he said Ricky had a brick wall in his mind. The psychiatrist said that Ricky refused to break that wall. He didn't like the life of living poor and had a very active imagination. End quote. Before his murder, Ricky often worked low skilled jobs such as manual labour or working as a dishwasher, floor mopper, etc. It was also said that Ricky had preferred to work the night shift meaning that he didn't have to interact with as many people and could come home before the daily hustle and bustle of the 9-to-5 began. He also suffered from chronic heart and lung problems into his later years, leaving him on disability benefits for his conditions. Ricky wasn't married, but he did have four children. Two of his four children were the result of a relationship he had with a 14-year-old girl. He was arrested when he was 34 years old in 1992 for the statutory rape of the girl. He was originally sentenced to serve three years, but only served 11 months of that sentence. McCormick's body was found on June 30th, 1999, in a cornfield in West Alton, Missouri. His body was discovered by a woman who was driving along the road that branched off from Route 367. The location was pretty isolated with no public transport running to this area, meaning that it was only accessible by car, something that Ricky McCormick didn't own. Ricky was found wearing nothing but filthy blue jeans and a stained white t-shirt that hung off his small five foot six frame. Medical examiners concluded that he had only died three days before being found which is an estimated date of death of 27th of June, 1999. His body was in an advanced state of decay for the timeline of his death. The recorded weather for the day his body was found was 80 Fahrenheit and about 80% humidity, which would have accelerated the decomposition, but not to the level that Ricky's body was found in. This led many people to theorise that Ricky had been kept in a warmer location, such as a shed or a greenhouse, before being dumped in the field. Because of the advanced state of decomposition and the state that his body was in, Ricky had to be identified by his fingerprints, which, as we know, were on record from his statutory rape arrest in 1992. Ricky's last known whereabouts before his murder were at the St. Louis Forest Park Hospital. He had checked himself in following severe chest pains. 
After that, no one saw Ricky again alive, and he wasn't reported missing by any of his friends or family. Due to police finding no motivation for Ricky's death, and the fact that none of his family had reported him missing, they initially ruled out, ruled out this case as being a homicide. This is despite the fact that Ricky's body was found in a remote area and he didn't own a car. Very mysterious. Now, it wasn't until 12 years later, in 2011, that the FBI reclassified McCormick's case to murder and appealed for the public to help with cipher messages that had been found on Ricky's body. There were two notes that were written in a code of, quote, jumble of letters and numbers occasionally set off with parentheses, end quote. The FBI cryptanalysis unit believed that the key to McCormick's strange and unsolved death will be solved when these codes have been deciphered. Both the FBI cryptanalysis and the American Cryptogram Association failed to crack the code. This is when the FBI appealed to the public's help. McCormick's own family admitted that as a child, Ricky would write in codes, write encrypted notes to himself, but no one in the family was able to understand these. It's possible that McCormick wrote these strange ciphers due to his inability to read and write in the like formal English way, and he had sort of began to adapt his own way of writing that he could understand. Now, on the other hand, many people have speculated that the codes were those used by local drug dealers to organise drop-off, pickups, etc. This is a claim that has never been confirmed or denied, and it still doesn't explain why McCormick's body was found in, a, in an isolated area and why he was never reported missing. Dan Olson of the FBI CRRU, which is the Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit, thinks that the heavy use of ease in the cipher could be used as a spacer, instead of the traditional space. Another cryptographer, Alinka Dunn, has also noticed the amount of patterns within the notes, so she noticed WLD, NCBE and SE. Also and Dunning both agreed that whoever wrote the notes had to be of high intelligence and was planning something large, otherwise why use a cipher? However, a lot of people point out that the cipher looks like it could be written by someone who mainly used scribbles and possibly had dyslexia due to the lack of traditional formatting. Now let's move on to the theories. One source that I found stated that Ricky took at least two bus trips to Orlando, Florida in 1999 before his murder. His girlfriend at the time was under the impression that Ricky was in Florida to pick up drugs, mainly weed. It was apparently commonplace for Ricky to accept jobs, drug running for various local dealers, which could explain the cipher. Now, the bags of weed were rumoured to be a man, for a man, sorry, called Baha Hamadala, who was the brother of the owner of the petrol station where Ricky worked. His girlfriend also testified that the weeks before Ricky's murder, he seemed to be distracted and scared. This adds weight to the theory that his murder and the cryptic notes were in relation to pick up and drop off sites and that Ricky's death was drug related. This isn't the first theory that has popped up regarding the sale of drugs. Many Redditors have theorised that these ciphers are code for drug drop off locations and that McCormick may have been working as a distributor for a local drug dealer. If this is the case, it's very possible that McCormick either knew too much about the operations or he had just simply crossed the wrong people. It has been revealed that he possibly associated with a man named Gregory Knox, who is known to be dangerous and violent. Had McCormick simply angered the wrong people and was murdered as a result? The area of land just off Route 367 was known to be a popular dumping ground for bodies, both before and after Ricky had gone missing. The area serves as the perfect dumping ground due to it being almost completely isolated and only accessible by car. Another theory that surfaced on Reddit by user daats underscore end 
recounts that the ciphered codes could be Ricky's own way of writing down information that the doctors gave him while at the hospital, suggesting that, in their own words, could be a form of, quote, ghetto shorthand, end quote. The user goes on to say that the notes should actually be read phonetically when you bear in mind that Ricky was extremely dyslexic and even had mental disabilities, according to his own mum. Another theory that sort of links in with the others, especially those that suggest was Ricky was very ill and his notes were nothing more than ramblings, was suggested by Rabbit, Rabbit Electronics, also from Reddit. The user put forward the theory that the notes were actually being used to track McCormick's medications and symptoms, which is common for sufferers of bipolar and other serious mental illnesses. Here is what they said. Start with the obvious, which is to check the key at the end. The time key is at the bottom of page 2, which was written first and as a log of medications. This is critical for people with suffering from bipolar to get their meds exactly right. This takes years of variation and must be coded, since doctors require that people who suffer from bipolar stay closeted due to publicity concerns regarding violent crimes. Weekday triggers indicate a work trigger. Month patterns indicate seasonal disorder, usually starting in the fourth quarter as indicated here. Years indicate home environment. Time of day for meds indicates sleepiness or a need for a stimulant in the morning, which is common in early years. Bottom of page two is DWMYMDL, which stands for day, weekday, month, year, morning, day, or late night. These are time designations that are critical to get your meds right when you're suffering from bipolar and they are coded for your own privacy. Body of page two reads A L P N T E G L S E dash S E E R T E. This user suggests that the A sequence is late night, Fernigan taken in evening. I apologise if I get these medication names wrong. They are quite difficult. And then the G sequence is late night, Serenan, Seroquel, extended release taken in evening. My own possible theory is that perhaps this murder is something to do with the rape of the 14-year-old girl who subsequently gave birth to two of his children. Now, it could be possible that either her family or just people in the community were so angry and outraged at his 11-month prison time that they decided to take justice into their own hands. There is one thing that sort of disproves this, and that's the fact that Ricky was sent to prison when he was 34 and was murdered when he was 41. If it was related to his rape charge, it seems more likely that vigilante justice would have been dealt a lot sooner, instead of waiting seven years. Possibly he could have been hiding, sorry, in hiding during that time, but seeing as though he was moving around the country and still working, it seems unlikely. Conclusion. No matter what theory you subscribe to, they all sort of agree on one thing, that the notes found on Ricky's possession hold the key to his murder. Perhaps one day, if somebody manages to decipher the messages, it might lead us to his killer. If you have any idea how to break the code, have seen similar codes, or have any information about the Ricky McCormick case, you are urged to contact the FBI using the following link, and I will leave the link in the show notes. Alternatively, you can write to the CRRU at the following address. FBI Laboratory, Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit, 2501 Investigation Parkway, Quantico, Virginia, 22135. Attention, Ricky McCormick case. Regardless of what Ricky McCormick was involved in prior to his death, He is a victim, and both him and his family deserve answers and justice for his murder. His ciphers may very well hold the mystery behind his death. 
and until they are decoded, it is possible that we will never know. Thank you for tuning in to this Patreon, not Patreon exclusive episode. I hope you enjoyed it if you would like to see more content like this. Obviously once situations get back to some semblance of normal, if we're ever going to get back to normal, I don't know. Um, you can subscribe to my Patreon for just $1 a month. Remember friends, wash your hands, stay safe, stay spooky, and stay inside the house. <laughs> Goodbye.